Welcome to this month's webinar. I'm Aaron Hill, Vice President at Saatchi Software. Today's webinar is Driver Analysis, How to Do It Badly and Well, and it will be presented by Keith Sean. Keith has been with us, uh, I don't know, how long have you been with us, Keith? About eight years. About eight years now, and uh, he has uh, over 30 years of marketing research experience in uh, a variety of client, supplier, and supporter, or uh, yeah, consulting roles. So prior to joining uh, Saatchi Software, he was at Maris, where he was uh, over there. Uh, there. He was their chief research officer. Um, so he's done a lot of stuff. And one of the things that Keith does really well is driver's analysis. So uh, we're going to turn the time over to Keith. During the webinar, if you have questions and answers, uh, please use the Q&A uh, and the chat options down at the, the bottom of your screen and your, your Zoom controls. Uh, and we will send out uh, a link to a recording of the webinar and to the slides uh, after the webinar is over. So within about 24 hours of when the webinar finishes. So with that, Keith, this, the screen is yours. All right, thank you, Aaron. Okay, so driver analysis is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I think it's probably the first multivariate analysis I did in my career back when I was on the client side in around 1987 or thereabouts. Um, and there are some similarities between driver analysis and conjoint analysis. I think sometimes people think, oh, it's odd that Sawtooth Software would be presenting this, uh, but I think I'll show you that there's, there's some links. Um, in conjoint analysis, we're typically showing people hypothetical products, um, but sometimes our research objectives involve having us understand what's important um, experientially to people. And so, Here's how driver analysis works. We have some overall evaluation or outcome variable, and often it's related to a particular experience or, um, or event in the real world. And we wanna model that. So what is it that drives overall satisfaction? We can't really ask people how satisfied they were with a hypothetical situation or a hypothetical product. We could ask them how much they like it or how much they would be willing to buy it or whatever and turn it into a conjoint analysis. But if we actually wanna find out what went well or badly about that last day at the hotel or your last visit to the restaurant, you need to measure satisfaction. And there's other variables like that, intent to return based on a prior experience, intent to recommend, their overall liking of a product experience, their, their purchase intent for a product given that they've tried it or seen an ad for it. So we collect this overall there, this overall evaluation, um, which again isn't is the, isn't a hypothetical entity particularly. It's usually a real a, a real event, and then we have some respondents provide ratings on a set of attributes, uh, and these are the the potential drivers that contribute to that overall measure and whose importance we want to measure, and these are typically measured with performance ratings like excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. Uh, or agreement ratings or, 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 uh, or scales like that. And then we're going to use a statistical model of some kind to, um, to model the relation between the drivers, which we're going to call the independent variables or IVs, and the overall measure, the dependent variable, the DV. Uh, and when we do that, we're going to, when, when we run that model, we're going to be able to quantify that relationship and we're going to try to quantify the importance of each of those drivers in, uh, in contributing to that overall measure. So that's how driver analysis is gonna work. Um, so here, I'm gonna talk about some ways to do driver analysis badly. One of the reasons that I uh, moved toward conjoint analysis in the first place many years ago was because the driver anal analysis methods that were available to me weren't very good. So we'll talk about correlation and regression. And we're gonna talk about how in a lot of ways, they're really two sides of the same bad coin. And we'll, we'll show some technical reasons for that and explain why that's the case. Um, then we'll talk about a little bit of a red herring here. Factor analysis is great, but I think in, in this conversation, it's a bit of a red herring and we'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about some ways to do driver analysis well. Uh, then we'll, we'll have a little bit of a summary. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share some R code with you and we can do a and A, okay? So let's do driver analysis badly for a few minutes. Uh, here's two ways I think we shouldn't typically do driver analysis. Correlation, we're going to look at the drivers independently, <clears throat> one at a time, and we're going to see how each one relates to the overall measure. In regression analysis, we're going to exert some multivariate control. We're going to enter all the drivers at once, 
and see how each one relates to the overall measure after partialing out or holding constant the influence of all the other attributes. <clears throat> so I, I've got a, uh, a little customer sat data set here from a few years ago in a prior life. It's got 1,284 respondents. <clears throat> it's a casual dining uh, experience study. So we asked people how satisfied they were with their, their visit to the casual dining restaurant. And we asked them to rate that restaurant in terms of 10 attributes, prompt greeting and cleanliness and so on. And then we run a correlation analysis and we get the correlation of each of those attributes with the overall measure. And what we can see is that all of the correlations are roughly, uh, you know, the same size. We don't see any order of magnitude differences. They're all fairly similar within, you know, in the 0.3 to 0.5 range thereabouts. <clears throat> um, one thing that's been, that's been suggested is that a better way of doing correlations is to square the correlations because then we have a way of interpreting them. Uh, <clears throat> the squared correlations can be interpreted as the percent of variance shared with the overall measure. So now for prompt greeting, we can say that, um, <clears throat> that prompt greeting shares 15% of its variance with the overall measure. And we can see maybe a little bit more discrimination with our correlations this way. <clears throat> anyway, that's a way that's been suggested for improving correlation. <clears throat> so we'll get rid of the raw correlations now and just keep the squared correlation. Uh, the other way of measuring uh, importances badly is, is to use multiple regression analysis. And so here we've run a regression model for our, for our dependent variable among our 1,200 respondents. And we get this, uh, the second column there are the regression coefficients. Uh, this regression had an R-square of 36%, so it explained 36% of the variation in the, in the dependent variable. The other 64% was, was simply unexplained. We don't know <clears throat> where that came from. Is it heterogeneity among respondents or, or what? We don't know. But that's a pretty typical result for a regression analysis. Uh, and, and so there's our regression scores. And you can see they, uh, if you, you know, they sort of agree with the, the, the correlations, not... not um, you know, they're obviously measured on different scales, but, uh, but there's some agreement there. The, the ones that are higher in terms of squared correlations tend to be higher in terms of regression coefficients. <clears throat> so what's, why do I think these methods are bad? Uh, in 1920, uh, a researcher named Thorndike noticed that evaluators tend to rate things they like higher on all the attributes. So if I like something, I tend to rate it more highly. I think Thorndike, one of his case studies was about uh, pilots, uh, Air Force pilots. And uh, if the supervisor liked the Air Force pilot, they rated them high on all sorts of attributes, including some attributes that didn't seem to have much to do with flying ability. Uh, and the other thing Thorndike noticed was that if, some, if the evaluator didn't like the pilot, they tended to give the pilot low ratings across the board. And in Thorndike's memorable words, uh, the attribute correlations were, quote, too high and too even. I like that. We call it the halo effect. So there's a fact about human behavior that, that, that's been known for, you know, 100 years now. It's the 100th year anniversary, I guess, of Thorndike's paper. So for 100 years, we've known that people use rating scales this way. The bad news is that that human behavior creates a statistical problem. <clears throat> that statistical problem is, is called multicollinearity. Multicollinearity doesn't sound as bad as it is, but uh, it's the statistical equivalent of a scary monster in a dark alley, okay? Multicollinearity is a pretty bad thing. And here's a correlation matrix for our little casual dining study. And you can see that each, each attribute is correlated 100% with itself. That's what's on the diagonal. And on the off diagonals are the correlations of each of, each of the, our 10 attributes with each of the other nine. And you can see that those are all pretty high. They're all in the 0.4 to 0.6 range. Um, now regression is a, can be a perfectly accurate measure of importance if all the diagonal cells are zero, but it gets less accurate as they get larger than zero. And these are quite a bit larger than zero. So multicollinearity, um, <clears throat> the, the halo effect is causing this multicollinearity. Collinearity. It's causing everything to be correlated with everything else. It's creating a knot for us to try to untie analytically. And uh, as I'll show you, correlation and regression aren't up to the job of untying that knot. 
So let's go back to some pictures now. We've, we've shown some numbers. Let's look at some pictures. Here's what correlation does. If we've got two predictors, uh, x1 and x2, predicting some dependent variable dv, the correlation of each predictor is the extent to which its variance overlaps with that of the dependent variable. So the, the correlation of x1 with the dependent variable is the area that I've got shaded in in purple here. Regression analysis takes a little bit of a different tack. Regression analysis says, you know, there's some shared variance between x1 and x2. If the off diagonals aren't zero, there's a bit of shared variance there. And we're going to throw it away for purposes of multiple regression. We're only going to look at the unique variance that x1 shares with x2. And that's why the shaded purple area uh, is missing the part where x1, x2, and the dependent variable all overlap. It's been thrown away. It's included in R square, but it's not really included um, in the regression coefficients. So this is regression on a good day. On a bad day, when we've got lots of multicollinearity, regression looks like this. Now x1 and x2 are pretty highly correlated. And the regression analysis is throwing away all of the area that overlaps between x1, x2, and the dependent variable. That large, that large slice is being just thrown away. And the only thing that's contributing to x1's importance is that little tiny sliver there. Now, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that, it, those, that, that, that x1 and x2, if they move even a little bit, the size of that sliver could change quite a bit. And that's, a, that's, that's an illustration of the kind of instability that comes from collinearity. So when we have multicollinearity, we're dealing with these tiny slivers, and we deal with instability. So if we, if we, uh, you know, if we bootstrap sample or we sample a different group of people or a subset of people, our regression coefficients are likely to change quite a bit just because of this instability. So how bad is our multicollinearity? Well, it turns out we can quantify uh, to some extent uh, multicollinearity. And one commonly used measure is called the condition index. And it's derived from a factor analysis of the predictor variables. And a condition index of less than five is considered good and should produce a useful regression analysis. A condition uh, index of 30 or more is considered a real disaster. It's extreme collinearity, and we, we're just, we just know it's going to ruin a regression. And in that very wide middle range, 5 to 30, is modest collinearity, and it may or may not be problematic. <clears throat> in the casual dining study, our condition index was 17.6, so it's squarely in that, that middle area. I don't think I've ever done a driver analysis where my condition index was less than five. Uh, I've never seen that kind of data come out of experience, uh, out of experience research because of the halo effect. So let's see, let's see what effect that collinearity has. So if we sum those squared correlations, uh, <clears throat> what we find is that together they're explaining 188% of the variance in the dependent variable. That's because the correlation is double counting all of that overlap variance that regression throws away, correlation double counts. And so here's just further evidence that the correlations <clears throat> and the squared correlations are too high because they're double counting importance. Regression analysis, on the other hand, only explain 30% of the dependence dependent variable, but because there was collinearity there, we had some instability. And we've got, a, we've got a reversal. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time in regression models is we get reversals. And so what this is telling us is if we believe these numbers, uh, when you go to a casual dining restaurant, you want a prompt greeting, you want an attentive server and good tasting food and so on, but you really don't want cleanliness. You'd like there to be uh, crumbs and napkins left on your table when you arrive. And that's just obviously false. <clears throat> but it, again, it happens all the time with regression analysis. Now we can do, just like I showed a slightly better way of doing correlation by squaring the correlations, there's a thing we can do with regression analysis. <clears throat> uh, 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 some authors named Tabachnik and Fidel in 1983 suggested that instead of looking at the correlation coefficients, we should look at what are called the squared semi-partial correlations. <clears throat> and they have the further benefit of telling us how much of the shared variance is being thrown out. And so on this table, I've got the regression coefficients with their reversal and the squared semi-partial correlations. 
which summed together only add to 8%, which means of that 36% that regression analysis is explaining of the dependent variable, 28 of that 36% is being thrown out because it's shared among multiple independent variables. And only 8% is contributing to the, to, the, to the coefficients, which is why we've got the reversal. One thing we can do to make those squared semi-partial correlations a little bit better is to normalize them to sum to 100, uh, and so we get scores like this. <clears throat> okay, so it's a little bit easier to interpret them. And, and it's, it's, what stands out pretty clearly here is that it's all about food taste and having an attentive server. The other things just don't count all that much, which to be fair is what the, uh, the regression coefficients say. And uh, if you look at the correlations, they're also telling kind of the same story. We're not changing the story here. Uh, we're just getting uh, some numbers that maybe we can trust a little bit more. Okay, so early on in my career when I was doing correlation and regression and I wasn't terribly satisfied with them, uh, someone suggested factor analysis. So let's talk about factor analysis for a minute. Factor analysis groups our individual attributes into uncorrelated factors, each one composed of related attributes. And when I say related, I mean correlated attributes. Now factor analysis has a long and successful history uh, in, in, in the world of psychometrics. It's because it's a great way of testing psychometric theories. If we have a theory about a, a psychological construct and that construct or factor is real, then the items that we think measure it should load together on a factor. So for instance, if we hypothesize that there's a factor called mathematical ability and we put some, some attributes, uh, we put some items in there that should be measuring mathematical ability, we would expect those items to be correlated with one another and to hang together in factor analysis. So we can use factor analysis to validate a conceptual model that we might have about some, some theory-driven constructs like risk aversion or price sensitivity or IQ or need for cognition or conscientiousness if we're doing a personality study. So that's one really good use of factor analysis. Another really good use, <clears throat> excuse me, of factor analysis is that if an item is a good measure of a construct, it'll load highly on a factor measuring that construct and not highly on any other factor. So we can also use factor analysis to test the validity of the items that we put in our measurement model. So we get the conceptual validity of the constructs and the validity of the measurement model. So factor analysis is a way useful tool for doing psychological research. But <clears throat> I have a lot of pets, okay? And I'm also an old guy, so I'm allowed to have pet peeves. And one of my pet peeves is that as wonderful as factor analysis is and as fun as it is to use and as useful as it is for the right applications, people use it wrongly. They abuse, poor factor analysis gets abused. So let's talk about what factor analysis isn't. Here's my pet peeve. That's what factor analysis isn't. It's not a garbage can. You can't just take a haphazard assortment of items with no particular theorized factor structure and throw them in the pot, run factor analysis, and then hope that the math sorts them all out and turns them into valid, useful factors. Because that's not a picture of pre-gold, okay? Alchemy isn't real. That's just garbage. <clears throat> so if you abuse factor analysis and use it like a garbage can, you might get a garbage result. <clears throat> you'll typically have items that cross load on several factors and they'll have their impact diluted. <clears throat> we see that a lot with what are oftentimes the most important items in a study load on multiple factors and then we miss the fact that they're important items. Or sometimes I've seen factor analyses where an, an important item doesn't load highly on any of the factors because uh, they don't share variance with the other items as much as the other items do with each other. <clears throat> Another problem I've had with factor analysis is even if I'm having a lucky day and I get a beautiful factor analysis, the interpretation is tough because factors are linear combinations of the items that load on them. So we could get an item uh, where the items ease of use, quality, and timeliness of delivery load on the same factor. I didn't pick those items accidentally. I actually ran a factor analysis and found those three items to load together. And I can tell you the VP of marketing who was my client uh, can't do anything with a factor that's the linear combination of ease of use, quality, and timeliness. 
It doesn't give him any actionability. There's nothing he can do with that information. He doesn't know how to change his service offering. So enough about my pet peeves. Let's talk about doing factor and driver analysis well, and hint it doesn't involve using factor analysis. <clears throat> The root problem is, is, is multicollinearity that's caused by the way human brains create a halo effect. That's the root problem. And so um, it would be great if we could improve our measurements and have people not uh, exhibit the halo effect. That would be solving the problem at its very root. I haven't found a great way to do that. Now, maybe in the Q&A someone will suggest a great way to do that and we should all go out and try it. In the meantime, uh, instead of getting to root causes, we can at least address the symptoms. We can at least find ways that uh, recognize that collinearity is going to happen and not just ignore it like regression and correlation do. One of those methods is called averaging over orderings, and it's a way of slicing up the overlapping variance, uh, a brute force way of doing it that I'll show you. Another way is called Johnson's relative importance measure, epsilon, and it's a, it's a nifty matrix algebra way of slicing up that overlap. <clears throat> and then a third method that we like uh, is called random forests, and I'll talk about it too. The first two above usually produce very similar results, not always. Uh, at Merits, my, my colleague Sharon Alberg once pointed out some cases where it doesn't always work, but typically they, they, they produce the same results. Um, and all three of these methods can give us ratio scaled importances that sum to 100%. <clears throat> when I say ratio scale, I mean that if an, if an importance has an importance of 20 and another attribute has an importance of five, we can, we can conclude that the one with the attribute importance of 20 is four times as, as important as the one with an importance of 5%. So let's go on. Averaging over orderings. Let's imagine we have a situation with three predictors. And uh, those predictors could enter a regression model in any of six possible orders, right? Um, a could be first and B second and C third, or A could be first or, and, and, B, and C second and B third, and so on. There's six possible orders. In two of those orders, A enters first. <clears throat> and that's essentially the, um, the, the, a regression analysis where a variable enters first is pretty much the same as uh, the result as correlation analysis. We also have two instances where it enters the model last, and that's effectively what multiple regression does uh, when, it, when it throws out all the overlapping variants and only uses the unique variants to, uh, to attribute to a, an attribute. And then there's two cases where uh, attribute A enters second, once it follows attribute B and once it follows attribute C, and I've got those color coded uh, just for your reference, but there's six possible orderings. <clears throat> So if, if f, let's, let's say f is the r squared for predicting the dependent variable when, uh, when attribute a enters the model first. So f stands for first, when it gets in before b and c. And uh, <clears throat> b is when it, it enters the model second following attribute b. Capital letter C is the incremental r squared that a adds to the model uh, when the model already includes attribute c but not b. And L is the incremental of R squared that, uh, that A adds when it enters the model last, after B and C are already in the model and after they've already gobbled up their share of the, uh, of the variance. <clears throat> so A's average contribution to R squared is uh, two times F plus B plus C uh, plus two times L divided by six. If you do that calculation for all three attributes, A, B, and C, uh, and then normalize them to sum to 100%, you get a, a measure called averaging over orderings. It's the average contribution to R squared over orderings <clears throat> across all the orderings. Now, I should point out that this, this averaging over orderings method is, is computationally intensive. Because if we have K predictors, there's K prime possible orderings. So for example, uh, if K is 21, there's 5.1 times 10 to the 19 possible orderings. That's more than there are grains of sand on the entire earth. It's a really large number of orders. It's even more than the grains of sand on this beach, which is from uh, one of America's most recent national parks, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the uh, Hoosier National, uh, the Hoosier uh, you know, national, uh, national Lakeshore uh, National Park uh, up in my neck of the woods. 
Anyway, what that means is that beyond about 20 predictors, averaging over ordering takes a really long time to run. So if you've got a, a model, then you're going to throw 25 predictors in there. Um, be prepared for a long run time. <clears throat> Just a little bit of history here. Averaging over orderings began in the days before the internet, back in 1980. And so it was discovered and rediscovered and rediscovered several times here. So uh, the earliest instance that it, that, that, that it can be found in is uh, in, a, in a general multivariate stats book by Lindemann, Miranda, and Gold in 1980, where they first gave this suggestion. Uh, it was rediscovered by Cox. It was rediscovered by Kruskal <clears throat> in 1987. Uh, it's, it's been subsequently extended to use information theory in 1988. Um, which is kind of neat because it generalizes the averaging over orderings method. Uh, <clears throat> if, if you use information instead of R squared sorts of metrics, you can use it uh, for logit models and things like that, which is really cool. And then other methods that were developed independently turn out to be the same as, as Lindemann, Miranda, and Gold. Like uh, Budescu in 1993 developed something he called dominance analysis, which turns out gives you the same answer as, uh, as, as, as was available in 1980. <clears throat> and so on. So there's a lot of different ways of doing averaging over orderings, but a lot of them turn out to be the same way, Lindemann, Miranda, and Gold, which will uh, abbreviate LMG. Uh, so if we add averaging over orderings to our little table here, uh, they're still only explaining 30% of, of the total variance with the dependent variable, uh, because all they're doing is taking that R squared and they're splitting it apart and they're allocating the overlapping part. So they're not ignoring it <clears throat> like regression does um, or double counting it like, like squared correlations do. Uh, they're only counting each piece, of that each piece of that variance once. And we end up with a set of importances here. Uh, that again, they show that the attentive server and the food taste are the most important thing. None of them are reversed, so we don't have any negative signs and they're, in, they're ratio scaled. So we can say things like, hey, having an attentive server is about a little over twice as important as having a comfortable environment. And having a good tasting food is about five times as important as cleanliness in people's experience of a, of a casual dining restaurant. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, so I said another way of dividing up that variance is algebraic in nature. And so here's some more history. Um, and again, this is before the days of the internet. So a fellow named Gibson uh, came up with the idea of deriving orthogonal variables uh, that are as close as possible to the survey variables. Essentially, you can think about it. If you've got some, you know, if you had 20 predictor variables, it's kind of like running a factor analysis with 20 factors, sort of, in a way. And then Rich Johnson, the founder of Sawtooth Software, a guy who's also very interested in conjoint analysis, uh, rediscovered the same thing in a different journal in 1966. Wasn't even aware that, uh, I think that, that Gibson had done what he did. <clears throat> uh, Paul Green, another name from the conjoint analysis literature in 1978, proposed a way of relating those orthogonal variables to the original variables that turned out not to be a very good way uh, for, a lot of, for some technical reasons. And so another Johnson, Jeff Johnson in 2000, proposed a better way of relating the original variables uh, with their orthogonal transformations. And he recalled this result, Johnson's epsilon. It's an algebraic solution for dividing up the overlap. And a couple of cool things about it. <clears throat> it works for any number of predictors. And it's very easy. You can actually take Johnson's paper, which is very clearly written, and program Excel to do this matrix algebra for you. Um, I went through that exercise once. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> when we add Johnson's epsilon, to our little chart here, one thing that stands out is the extremely close agreement between averaging over orderings and epsilon. Um, they, they have the same goal, but they achieve it in two different ways. Uh, averaging over orderings is dividing up incremental contributions to R squared over all possible orderings using a brute force algorithm that can take a while to run sometimes if you've got a large number of variables. And epsilon is doing a little bit of matrix algebra that solves almost instantly, like regression analysis. And it turns out they divide up the variance almost identically. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> and then the third good way of doing driver analysis I want to talk about was proposed in 2001 by Bremen, 
Uh, it's, a, it's called random forests. And you've probably used or heard or talked about random forests before. Uh, instead of a single regression tree like you get with CART, random forest builds a forest of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 trees. And because each tree only uses a subset of respondents, and at each branch in each tree, the algorithm only, only considers a random subset of the attributes, it has these two randomizations in it that together do what's called decorrelating the forest. As a result, um, we don't have those problems with collinearity that we have with regression analysis. And random forest produces a couple of importance measures, one of which, which is called the increase in node purity, seems to work better to me as a measure of relative importance. So it's the one I use. So let's add random forest to our little table here. <clears throat> random forest isn't explaining variance, so we don't have an entry on the bottom line. But if you look at it, it's pretty darn close to what we got from averaging over orderings and epsilon. Uh, this, we've normalized the scales, to, uh, we've normalized the importances to sum to 100. And you know, by golly, if we're not getting pretty much the same answer with all three of those methods, that's, that's encouraging that there's that kind of convergence. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes folks will ask about significance testing, you know, hey, can we, can we find out which of these attributes are significant? And the answer is in most of these methods we can. We can't really with random forests, or at least I haven't found out how. Maybe there's a way to do it in random forests, and I just haven't figured out the code to write to do it. But in any case, I, I, don't, I don't yet know a way to do that. But the other methods, you can, uh, um, you know, you can, get, you can get correlations straightforward, you can get significance straightforwardly out of regression analysis or correlation. Uh, uh, it's, it's something you can do through bootstrap sample, sampling for, uh, for averaging over orderings in epsilon. And what you can see is that if it's correlation or averaging over orderings or epsilon, in, this, in the case of this study, all of the attributes were significant. Um, in the case of regression analysis, where in, this, in our case, what, three quarters or more of the variance was just thrown away, uh, the remaining variance isn't, there's not enough remaining variance there to make all of the attributes significant. So only a handful are. Okay. I mentioned a minute ago how convergent uh, some of the methods were. And so here's a correlation matrix of the importance measures. So I've got the, the, five, the, the six methods that were on our table a few minutes ago. I looked at how correlated they were with one another. And what I find is that epsilon and averaging over orderings uh, are, are very nearly perfectly correlated with each other, their result for this study. And uh, the, next most, the next highest correlation is between random forests and, uh, and the other two. So that's, that's pretty cool. Those three methods that I think are good methods um, that, that that, uh, I mean, random forest does an entirely different thing than splitting up variance, and epsilon and averaging over ordering take very different approaches to splitting up variance, and all three methods come up with a pretty much the same answer. I like convergence when I do research. It makes me think that I might actually be onto something like the truth. <clears throat> uh, so in that study, we had a, we had a, a pretty, uh, you know, a, high, a pretty highly collinear data set. Let's look at three more. And these are three more just randomly selected sort of um, customer set data sets that I had lying around. Uh, an airline study with a condition index of 17, still in that, uh, that middle zone between 5 and 30. Uh, an auto service uh, uh, customer sat study, or actually it's a loyalty study, I guess, uh, with a condition index of 19.6. And then a burger joint study. Um, with a condition index that's, that's even over that 30 threshold. So we just know that one's gonna be bad. Has a condition index of 33.8. Complete disaster of a study actually, uh, from, <clears throat> from a statistical standpoint, if you wanted to do regression analysis. So what happens? Well, in our airline importance study, we see the same story we saw previously. Um, <clears throat> more than three quarters of the variance of, of that shared variance gets thrown out. That's why we have a 7% under the normalized squared semi-partial correlations where the total uh, R squared was 38%. So the regression analysis is throwing out a tremendous amount of information. <clears throat> but the last three methods, averaging over orderings, epsilon and random forests, very largely agree. <clears throat> the same is true in the auto service study. We have more attributes here. Uh, you can see that on our regression analysis, we had 
not one, but three reversals. You've got three things that ought to have positive correlations, but have negative, ought to have positive coefficients, but have negative instead. Uh, so this would have us believe that people don't want the auto service to be easy to use, uh, to be, you know, to be informative and keep me informed, or to understand my problems, <clears throat> which obviously doesn't make sense. Uh, again, the, 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 uh, the, the averaging over orderings and uh, Johnson's epsilon, pretty highly in agreement, a little bit less so, but still random for us, largely agrees with those two methods. <clears throat> And then in the burger joint study, the one that we said is, uh, is a complete disaster, you can see that of the 89% R squared, 88%, 88 of those 89 percentage points are overlapping variants, and the regression analysis throws them away. <clears throat> so there's a, an extreme case of collinearity where the information that contributes to the regression analysis is just a tiny fraction of the R squared. And again, we're seeing great agreement between averaging over orderings and epsilon, and, and, to, a, and to some extent, uh, although a lesser extent, random forests. Uh, if I look for convergence again across all four of our studies now, instead of just the one, uh, what we see is that again, it's the averaging over orderings and epsilon that agree almost perfectly. And the next highest on this chart is the, uh, the correlation of random forests with, those, with the other two. So again, a uh, tremendous amount of convergence uh, among three very different methods, uh, which is heartening uh, for those analysts who like to know that what they're doing is robust. And because I always hate it if, you know, if I think I've done an analysis, but man, if I'd have done it a little bit differently, I'd have gotten a very different answer. This gives me comfort that if I do it any one of these three ways, I'm kind of, I'm kind of on the right path. Okay, so by way of summary, Common importances, common measures of attribute importance, I think are pretty badly flawed. Uh, regression analysis and correlation, that is, are pretty badly flawed. They can be improved, but I think only a little bit. <clears throat> There's newer methods, averaging over orderings, Johnson's epsilon, and random forests that make more sense and that show convergent validity, which is nice. Uh, of those, averaging over orderings and Johnson's relative important measure, epsilon, are the two that tend to agree the most. And so my recommendation coming out of this is, if you're doing driver analysis, if you have 20 or fewer predictors, go ahead and run averaging over orderings. That LMG algorithm takes a little bit of time, but uh, tip it for a problem with 20 or fewer predictors, it usually only takes a couple minutes, and, and, and often even less. Often it's done in seconds. Um, if I've got models with 20 or more predictors, with more than 20 predictors, however, uh, I don't let I don't let averaging over orderings just crank away forever because I'm impatient. So I use Johnson's epsilon because it solves in an instant. <clears throat> and in those cases where I have predictors that are measured on different scales, like I've got some predictors that are categorical and some that are rating scales, for instance, then I really rely on random forests because epsilon and averaging over orderings don't do a great job when your attributes are measured on different scales. So. <clears throat> We won't do it now, but by way of summary, if you want to understand my recommendations, there's a YouTube video you could watch, uh, uh, callback from my childhood ever so many years ago when my, when my mom had me watch Romper Room. There's a little song there that tells you what to do and what not to do if you want to be a good little kid. A cute little video. Anyway, <clears throat> some special bonus material. I've done this presentation a few times before and, uh, and some questions have come up. So, one of the things people ask about is, hey, what if I've got predictors with a negative relationship with the dependent variable? What if the correlation you know, is negative and the, and, and the result ought to be uh, negative? <clears throat> In that case, I'll oftentimes just you know, type my, uh, make sure I use a red font for the importance so that we understand that there's been a reversal. Alternatively, I might just reverse the attribute label instead. Easy problem to solve, I think, typically. A Little bit harder, what if I don't have access to R? Well, that's, that's a little bit of a problem, but if you really wanted to run Johnson's Epsilon in particular, um, there's a website you can go to at uh, Davidson University. You, you just click on this link, you load your data in, you tell it what the dependent variable is, you answer a couple of other questions, you hit a button, and about 10 minutes later in your email, your Johnson's Epsilon analysis shows up as a results file in your email. The neat thing about that website is they also have uh, versions of Johnson's Epsilon that they've done for a logistic regression, 
when you've got a binary dependent variable, and for multivariate regression, not just multi, um, <clears throat> multi not just multiple regression, but actual multivariate regression where you have multiple dependent variables. So that's kind of cool. And then uh, if you do have R, well, how do I run these? <clears throat> what resources can I go to? Well, of course, you can always go to, to Google and, and uh, have Google tell you how to run these things in R. But what I've also done on the next several slides is I provided the R code for you. So on this slide, the first half of the code is just reading in the data. And the last four lines show you how to run a correlation matrix uh, or run a regression analysis. At, on the top half of this slide, if you want to compute the squared semi-partial -par correlations uh, between the dependent variable and each of 10 independent variables, you can use this code here at the bottom, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> that was a, that's a fun bit of code. If you want to run averaging over orderings using LMG, there's a library called Rela-Impo in R. And the code is very simple. It's right here. Uh, all you have to do is reproduce this for your data set and you're good to go. Uh, there are some other relative importance measures included in that library Rela Impo. So it's, uh, and if you live outside the US, there's even an algorithm uh, <clears throat> that for patent reasons isn't available to our users in the United States that is available to our users outside the US. So I've never had a chance to play with that one, but uh, it would be cool. Um, <clears throat> And then Johnson's epsilon is a little bit harder to run in R because you actually you have to compute the correlation matrix first and input that into, the, in, into this program. But um, I mean, it's just a matter of copying and pasting your correlation matrix and adding a little bit of code and boom, you've run Johnson's epsilon in R. And again, this works from any num for any number of predictors from a simple correlation matrix. Think about what that means if you've got missing data you could run your correlation matrix using pairwise deletion, and you wouldn't even have to worry about missing data in your analysis. Way cool. And then here's the code for random forests, um, <clears throat> which I just pulled out of an R book, uh, and, uh, and it runs real nicely for you. you, you there's some user, you know, you, there's some things you can do to, to change the way it handles missings or to, uh, to change which importance measure you're looking at or how many trees are included in your little forest but it's, it's easy to do. <clears throat> and then if you, if you don't trust anything I've said or don't trust something I've said or just wanna read more about something I've said, <clears throat> I think here are all of the references that you might find handy. Uh, so good luck. With that, I think we've left some time here, about 15 minutes, wow, right on the nose, for Q&A. So uh, at that point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Q&A now. Okay, perfect, thanks Keith. Uh, okay, so, uh, questions. We had a lot of questions about uh, what your thoughts are on ridge regression and does that solve any of the issues that you've addressed? You know, that's a really good point. I probably should have put ridge regression in here. I haven't been convinced that ridge regression always solves my problems at all. If I get collinearity that's really bad, um, <clears throat> or if I take different subsets of my sample, I've found, I've seen instability in ridge regression that doesn't give me a lot of confidence in it. That said, um, because I haven't liked what I've seen with it, I haven't used it to the extent I've used these methods. So uh, it could be that I'm just wrong about that, but I don't believe uh, in the literature, it's not, I, I haven't seen it, uh, I've seen some agreement with my point of view, which it doesn't so seem to solve these problems adequately. Okay. All right, and uh, I know you mentioned Shapley value, but could you comment on Shapley value and how it's related to uh... Yeah, sure. Shapley value is um, in, in, in um, I think it was 2001, uh, Lipovetsky and Conklin uh, did a paper, a, a presentation where they showed that um, you could come up that 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 Shapley value that that uh, the averaging over orderings uh, was implicit in Shapley's work, you know, also many years ago. And so it turns out that if you run Shapley value, it's the same thing as running. That, uh, that LMG algorithm in averaging over orderings. So it, it, just, it just is, remember I said how it was discovered multiple times by different authors, um, not all of whom even knew uh, about the others. Uh, that's another case of that. Um, it was developed you know, without reference to Shapley, but it turns out it can be uh, derived from Shapley. From Shapley. So uh, that's kind of cool. Again, uh, a good idea that just has, seems to have emerged independently several times over the years, but LMG 
just is Shapley value. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Keith. Um, where there's another question. Where does the uh, SR two come from? Ah, it's um so. It, when you run a regression analysis, if you partial out the, uh, the effects, if, if you look at one attribute uh, and partial out the effects of all the others, you get something called a partial correlation. And, uh, <clears throat> and depending on the, uh, let's see, I think it's the, the, depending on the denominator that you use for that, it can be either a partial correlation or a semi-partial. So it's one of the, al it's one of the matrix algebra components that goes into multiple regression. And using that R code I showed you just a minute ago, you can ask for it separately. So uh, you can also you can also get the squared semi-partial correlations. They're an optional thing you can ask for if you're running a regression in uh, SPSS. You can ask for those, and it'll just print out as a separate column next to your zero-order correlations, your partial correlations. You'll get your semi-partials there, and uh, I think I think it's the yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether it's the collinearity diagnostics you have to ask for, but one of the options that you have to ask for, it'll print right out for you in SPSS. But it's, it's part of the matrix workings of multiple regression. Okay. Okay. Uh, when, when you talk about predictor variables, uh, are you talking about just statistically significant predictors? How would you find out whether a variable is statistically significant? Could you reduce them down at some point? Um, <clears throat> Or do you just throw them all in? Well, um, what, when, I, when I learned about regression analysis back in school, that was certainly what the professor suggested. You know, run the analysis, throw out the ones that aren't significant, and just keep the ones that are. So that would be the equivalent to the second column on this page, right? So uh, four of the, when I run a regression analysis, four of them are significant, so I keep those four, and I throw away the rest, which is handy because you're typically throwing away the reversals. So you, you don't have to think about the reversals. So I would tell my client, <clears throat> it's food taste above all, followed by attentive server, followed by reasonable price, followed by having an appropriately paced meal, and nothing else matters. Now, I think all of us know that those other things matter to some extent. It doesn't make sense that the cleanliness of the restaurant doesn't matter to people. That just, that, that intuitively, that just doesn't ring true. <clears throat> Also, in my experience, when I'm not doing regression analysis for my professor and I'm doing it for my client, my client might have a particular care about these things. My client's boss, the VP of marketing, uh, is the one that added that friendly server attribute in there. And my client doesn't want to go to his boss and say, ah, eh, the attribute you added isn't important. It doesn't matter. You were just wrong, boss. Um, so if, in, in, my, in my experience, it's been more palatable to deliver results that give an importance, even if only a small one, to all of the attributes, rather than just throwing them away and saying uh, they're not measurably important. And I think too that there's some, uh, you know, the correlations are showing that those things are important. And, and the, the averaging over orderings is showing that they are significant. So the fact that regression analysis is throwing so much variance away, so much of that shared variance away, it's really hampering its ability to find significant things. Okay, uh, another question. How would you best deal with missing data? Do these methods allow you to have missing data? If, if not, what do you do? Ah, good, good question. Um, certainly, um, Random Forest doesn't have a problem with it. In fact, in, in the Random Forest code I showed you a minute ago, right there, let's see, in the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth line down at the end, uh, NA, it's asking us what action we want to take with missing data. And I've, for this particular bit of code, I've chosen the solution that R calls a rough fix, okay? R has different strategies we can take when we've got missing data in there. And, and we, can, we can pick and choose among them. Um, in Johnson Epsilon, I just run, I run my correlation matrix based on pairwise correlations and not listwise. And then it, uh, it, it, does, it, then handles, it, it just ignores the missing data and goes on and runs my correlations. So again, I've handled the correlations very nicely. Um, for, for LMG, I think we probably would need to get in there 
and, and add a bit of instruction about how to handle the missings if there were any. Just like we did with, just like Random Forest does, I think we'd have to specify what to do with missings. So they, they, they can be a problem, but it's a problem that's usually pretty easily gotten around. Now I should say that there's different kind of missings, right? There's missings that, hey, the respondent didn't answer this question, and then there are what I might call structural missings. Hey, the respondent didn't answer this question because, um, <clears throat> because they were skipped out of it, right? So a respondent who uh, you know, went to our restaurant, <clears throat> let's see here, let's go back to our restaurant. They went to the restaurant, um, <clears throat> but they didn't pay the bill. Maybe they didn't answer the question about whether the restaurant was reasonably priced or not because they don't know what the price was. Maybe they got it for free. And so we might have a bit of structural missing there. So I think you'd want to think a little bit about what do I want to do there with my missing data? Do I just want to do pairwise deletion, which is probably what I'd do, uh, or do I want to do some kind of mean substitution? Or, you know, you, you might, might want to think about theoretically how I should treat that missing data. Okay. <clears throat> recommendations, Keith, on the number of max, uh, the maximum number of predictors you want to use. And if you've got hundreds of these things, wh where do you draw the line? You know, most, I, I think that the, the studies I've picked here are a pretty good representation. I would guess, um, <clears throat> I, I shouldn't say that. In some of our, in some of my customer stat studies, I've had, I've had a lot more um, attributes than in others. So I, I, I would say, you know, I, I pick the, these are ones, that, these are studies that I actually wrote, but I've, I've faced customer stat store studies where I've had, you know, 60 or 70 predictors. <clears throat> now, I don't think there's 60 or 70 independent attributes in much of anything, so I really try to get my clients to uh, reduce them down and, and come with a more manageable list. But the truth is, if I'm willing to run uh, um, averaging over orderings using Johnson's Epsilon, there's no logical upper limit to the number of, uh, of attributes. I can, have, uh, I can have attributes almost up to the number of, of, of respondents that I have, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think a good rule of thumb is that you'd like to have at least as many, you'd like to have 10 times as many uh, respondents as attributes. So that, that might be one way of thinking what, what a reasonable maximum could be. But mathematically, there's, there's no reason I couldn't have 150 of these predictors. Uh, you know, and some of my clients, rather than doing factor analysis, what they would do is they would do the averaging over orderings and then they, could, then they could group the attributes at will on the back end. They could look at the attributes and say, well, hey, I think these have to do with the pre-flight experience and let's sum their importances because these, these importances are not only ratio scale, they're additive, which is kind of cool. So here's the pre-flight experience. Um, here's, some, here's some attributes that have to do with the in-flight experience. Here's some attributes that have to do with the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the post-flight experience, picking up my luggage or whatever. And so the respondents can, or the, the users of the research can group them at will if you've done that. <clears throat> All right, uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, next question, how do you explain the interpretation from the results to executives that may not be familiar with these methods? Oh, I never, I learned long ago that you don't use words like squared semi-partial correlation with executives. Um, <laughs> So with executives, I would show one of these columns, whichever one I felt like reporting, which would, would depend on the number of attributes. But if it were under 20, I would use the, the averaging over orderings. If it were over 20, I'd probably use Johnson's Epsilon. And if I had a mix of categorical and metric variables, I'd use random forest. But I would show, I'd show my attribute list and one, core, one vector, and I would just label it importances. And uh, <clears throat> that's about as far as I would get into it unless my unless my client was really statistically oriented and really wanted to get down in the weeds. Uh, and then I'd probably talk to them a little bit. And about the time I would say squared semi-partial correlations, their brain would turn off and they would just leave me alone. <clears throat> do, you, do you ever rescale these numbers? It's so like when you've got the, you know, LMG results that sum to 56%. Would you ever go in and rescale those so they sum to 100%? Oh, or? they do. They do now. They're, in this case, they're explaining 50% of the variance, but I've already rescaled them so that they sum to 100. Okay. And you just do a straight rescaling or? Just a straight rescaling, yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any comments on uh, what you might do differently if uh, some or all of your variables are 
binary variables or uh, yeah, categorical variables? Yeah, well, there's a couple things, right? So one thing I could do is <clears throat> when I get my correlations, um, if you run a, a typical correlation matrix, uh, you, you get Pearson, Pearson regression, or you get Pearson correlations, right? Which assume that you're using metric variables. Uh, but there are other, you know, there are other kinds of correlation like points by serial correlation and so on that allow you to get um, correlations of metric variables with binaries or with multi-category categoricals. So you could <clears throat> run the appropriate correlations and then put them into your correlation matrix and go ahead and run Johnson's epsilon if you want it. But, I <clears throat> but the truth is, I, I think that the correlations are qualitatively different. I think that you're, you're just going to get lower correlations between uh, metric variables and categorical ones. So I would really, that's the time when I would really say, I would just use random forests because it's, it's more immune to the differences in scale amongst your predictors. And in fact, I list in the presentation, that's one of the reasons I would particularly recommend random forests is when you've got multiple different kinds of scales amongst your predictors. Okay. Okay, I think that's uh, about all the time we have for questions. Oh, uh, one, one last one. I think we've got time for maybe one quick one. Do you know if any of these things are available in SPSS? Uh, yes, actually. Um, <clears throat> you can, obviously correlation and regression are, but you can, you can Google, um, there's at least two implementations of Johnson's Epsilon that I've seen done uh, for SPSS. Uh, one that I found most recently when I searched, and then an original one that Jeff Johnson himself, he wrote two different versions of it, one using, uh, <clears throat> one where you just input the raw variables and one where you input a correlation matrix. And uh, so you, you can look for Jeff Johnson's code. And again, if you have any questions, by the way, when this is done or uh, you want any of this code, just uh, send me an email. I'm on vacation the next week and a half, but after that, I'll be glad to get back uh, and answer your emails. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Keith. Uh, just a reminder that recordings and PDF copies of the presentation will be available on the webinar page 24 hours after the event. So uh, hopefully sometime tomorrow we'll have those posted. Uh, the next webinar will be September 24th. Uh, Brian Orm, president of Satu Software, will, will be presenting on the pros and cons of market simulations using randomized first choice versus uh, HB draws. And you can find more information on that on our website at www.satusoftware.com and then click on training uh, and then webinars. Uh, if you have questions about purchasing Satu Software, call us or email brandon at sawtoothsoftware.com. If you have any other questions, you can reach out to uh, Keith. His email address is up on the screen. Uh, Keith, just so you know, there's a bunch of questions that we didn't get to. I think there's 40, 40 some odd questions still left to answer. Uh, we'll try to get back to you on some of those questions after the webinar is over. But we thank you so much for uh, coming to the presentation today. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something from it. Uh, stay healthy and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks everybody. Thank you.